Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. the Night Stalker. Between the years of 1984 and 1985, Los Angeles and San Francisco were shrouded in an atmosphere of terror because of a mysterious killer. He enjoyed sneaking into the victim's home, killing and dismembering them in a cruel manner. Ramirez did not have a particular preference for gender, although male victims were killed by gunshots and since he had a great contempt towards women, he would abuse, beat and ultimately rape them. Ramirez, after finishing the crime, Ramirez would leave a unique mark, a five-pointed star, on the wall, on the mirror, and even on the victim after his many crimes. Ramirez was finally arrested for his criminal behavior in August of 1985 when a man witnessed him attempting to hijack a vehicle, and he was beaten by several men who later contacted the police. In 1989, the Los Angeles City Court ruled that Ramirez was convicted of 43 counts, including theft, rape, and 13 murders. He was sentenced to death. Ramirez was a prime example of a psychopathic serial killer. And on today's episode of Demystifying Medicine, Psychopaths Inside the Mind of a Prisoner. So does anyone truly know the definition of a psychopath? Or do we just use this word aimlessly? Psychopathy is defined as an antisocial disorder in which an individual manifests amoral and antisocial behavior, shows a lack of ability to love or establish meaningful relationships, expresses extreme egocentricity, and demonstrates a failure to learn from experience. Psychopaths are among one of the most interesting individuals in our society. They can be regular individuals that blend in and seem totally normal. It can be your coworker, your friend, or simply anyone that you encounter throughout your daily life. Psychopathy is not considered a mental disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, but it is rather considered a subtype of antisocial personality disorder. A individual who has antisocial personality disorder may not necessarily be a psychopath, but they share many similar traits such as impulsivity, deceitfulness, irresponsibility, aggression, and antisocial behavior. Due to the overlap of traits, some psychologists and researchers refer to a checklist which helped make a better distinction between the two concepts. Robert Hare, a Canadian psychologist, has researched the topic of psychopaths for over 30 years. He formulated a revised psychopathy checklist which has a two-factor structure. The first factor is the predominant factor that influences the difference between a psychopath and someone who has antisocial personality disorder. It involves both affective and interpersonal symptoms, which includes items such as superficial charm, manipulation, and lack of empathy and remorse. The second factor provides more insight on the similarities that psychopaths and individuals with antisocial personality disorder both have. Despite psychopaths being insensitive and showing a lack of emotion and empathy, they may act like they have emotions in order to fit in when in reality, they have no sense of conscience which makes them highly dangerous. For example, a psychopathic person may shoot someone knowing that this is wrong and they will die. However, the individual will feel no guilt for their actions. These individuals are often highly logical and will weigh out the pros and cons of a situation in order to get a reward, making them the perfect criminals. Although psychopaths make up roughly 1% of the general population, they make up 15-25% to of the prison population in North America. In fact, psychopathy is the highest variable that is correlated to being in prison, in which they are related to half of all serious crime. Individuals in prison were also found to have a higher score on the psychopathy checklist, completing 20 out of 40 items, compared to the general population of 6 out of 40. Now let's take a look at the biological mechanisms. The problem of psychopathy stems from the dysfunction of the brain. The two parts of the brain that are correlated with the onset of psychopathic tendencies are the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. The main function of the amygdala is to regulate various aspects of emotional and behavioral processing. Various studies have been done to see how amygdala activity varies between individuals eliciting psychopathic tendencies and those who are not. And in most studies, decreased amygdala activity was observed. Due to a dysfunctional amygdala, psychopaths cannot use important cues that would help them 
have an effective behavioral response. If the amygdala is damaged early on in an individual's life, they will not be able to develop key behavioral and personality traits that are important for later stages of life. Similarly, the prefrontal cortex plays an important role in decision-making and execution of behavior. A dysfunctional prefrontal cortex can lead to severely impulsive behavior and a lack of empathy and morals. This may ultimately lead to social isolation later on in life. What factors lead to someone becoming a psychopath? These factors can either be environmental or genetic. The contribution that human genetics has in the makeup of a psychopath is still unclear despite the heritability of severe antisocial behavior being up to 50%. It was found that abnormal levels of glucose in the body and abnormal transmission of chemicals can contribute to the violent actions associated with psychopaths. Psychopathy can also be influenced by environmental factors that can develop early on in life. Factors such as child abuse, drug use, peer influence, academic failure, and rejection can all lead to the development of psychopathic tendencies and traits. Now, are there any potential remedies or treatments for psychopaths? Well, unfortunately, there is currently no cure for psychopaths. The violence attributed to psychopathic tendencies can put a heavy burden on the public health and criminal justice systems. Unfortunately, there has been a limited amount of effective treatment options for psychopathic actions, as well as some interventions may even make it worse. That's why the outcomes are highly dependent on the specific components of treatments. Evidence supports that a more tailored treatment approach is effective when dealing with psychopaths. Now that you have learned more about psychopaths, the next time you watch a documentary about a specific psychopath, you'll have the basic understanding on what a psychopath is and the mechanism behind it. Thank you for watching, and if you have any questions, you just search psychopath up, and plenty of resources will be at your disposal.